Record. There you go. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to the first session of Earth Day every day this this fall. We are so glad to see so many of you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go through some of the information uh, about this webinar, and then we'll all introduce our, our speaker. I'm Michelle Backus, and I am with uh, Rutgers Cooperative Extension. Uh, most of you who have been us, with us before know this, but I'll, for those of you who are new, uh, Rutgers Cooperative Extension is the outreach arm of Rutgers University. Uh, we're a partnership between the, the counties that we serve and the, the university, so you can go to any county in the state and get your questions answered by, by Rutgers staff. Um, and this webinar series, this Earth Day Everyday webinar series is part of Rutgers Cooperative Ext Extension. The purpose of this series is it was started during, uh, right at the beginning of, of COVID and, and uh, it was the 50th anniversary of Earth Day and we wanted to give people ideas about what they could be doing to help the environment while they were at home and it's been very popular. So we have continued it, but that's the purpose of the series to help you do what you can to help the environment, protect the environment at home and also in your community. So tonight we are using Zoom for this webinar and uh, you, you can see us and you will be able to uh, see and hear the presenter, but you cannot see e each other. You can also chat with us. So on the lower right hand side of your screen, you should be able to send us questions through the, the chat box. You can send them to me. You can send us it to the panelists. Uh, you can send it to all of the, your questions to um, the panelist and me. It's it's up to you. You all also should be muted, and I would appreciate if you would stay uh, muted. So at the end of this session, we are going to be starting a poll about ten questions. So so please, at the end of the session, make sure that you answer our poll questions. I also want to let you know that these sessions are free to the public, but please consider making a, don a donation to our, our program, to the Rector's Environmental Stewards Program. And I will go ahead and put the link to the Rector's Environmental Stewards Program in the, the chat box and those uh, funds help to support our volunteer efforts, internships, scholarship and, and supplies. Just go ahead and put Earth Day in the notes when you make your donation. So George, if you could go to the next slide. Thank you. So Rutgers requires us to let you all know that uh, you are now part of a research project. You are all research subjects. And basically what that means is that you are taking part in this webinar series. And also we will be following up with you in about six months to see what actions you have adopted that we taught in this webinar series. So at the end of the poll, you'll see a question that asks you uh, whether or not you wanna participate in that research study. And that's all it is that we're gonna send you a survey in about six months to see how effective this, this webinar series is. So without further ado, we are thrilled that George Hamilton is with us this evening. George is the chair of the Department of Entomology He's also director of the graduate program in entomology, and he's also the extension specialist in entomology with Rutgers Cooperative Extension. And he's going to be speaking with us tonight all about uh, spotted lanternfly, uh, what you can do, how to identify it. So I will go ahead and I'll turn it over to you, George. Okay, great. Well, good evening. And thank you for inviting me tonight. As was said, I'm going to try and update you all a bit on the spread and management of spotted lanternfly here in New Jersey. We are currently not exactly at the beginning, but a couple of weeks into the presence of the adults, which is when most people are most familiar with this insect because it's rather large. And it's currently flying around and showing up at places like Costco gas pumps and other places here in New Jersey. And so this is what the, spot, the adult spotted lanternfly looks like. It's very colorful. Its hind wings, as you can see, are red with black spots. 
uh, and some white and uh, black on them. The front wings are kind of grayish in color and have the black spots and other markings on it. And when it flies, you can also see the abdomen, which you see here in the picture. It's a bright yellow with black striping on it. And so it's an impressive looking insect. Um, many people think this is a moth. Um, it is not a moth. It is a leaf hopper in the family Fulgoridae, and only the entomologists out there are going to know what that means. But that's a special group of leaf hoppers. They normally occur in Asia, and this insect is native to northern China, and it's invasive here in the United States, at least in the East Coast for right now. And I'll talk a little bit about where it is in terms of the, of the US itself. Um, it's invasive because it has the potential to create agricultural damage and also um, environmental damage. And, and, and a species has to meet one of those two criteria. It either has to cause economic or environmental damage to be considered invasive. Um, it's also invasive in Asia. Um, it's invasive in South Korea, Taiwan, Vietnam, Japan, and of course, the US. And it has a preference for feeding on plant material that's high in sugars. And that plays into part of the story in terms of it being um, an invasive insect. We do have fulgorids here in the United States. Um, below the picture of the adult spotted lanternfly, you will see on the left this blue and red striped leafhopper. We have these here in New Jersey. They are considerably smaller and they don't create the same kind of damage. Um, that this leafhopper does. And then I have another example here on the right side under that adult spotted lanternfly of another lanternfly from Asia. And so you can see that they are very colorful and um, the ones in Asia are much larger than the ones that we have here in the United States. So here's the beginning of the story uh, in 2014. Uh, this insect was found in Berks County, and the story goes that it was found in, in a yard that had shipments of stone from China. They feel as though it got into the country as egg masses that were laid on the flat stones on those pallets. They hatched, they started to spread out. The owners of the property uh, realized that it wasn't something that we have here in the United States. And they called the Pennsylvania uh, Department of Agriculture. And so the story started. Today, uh, almost 10 years later, um, this insect has spread through many parts of Pennsylvania. And what you're looking here is a map at the counties in Pennsylvania where they are in a quarantine situation. Those are the counties in um, purple. The counties in blue are counties that were added to the quarantine this year. So it's not only New Jersey that has been adding things to their quarantine. Pennsylvania is continuing to do this as well. And so for us, this started in 2018 um, with the, the initial reports of this insect in, in Warren County and then in Mercer County. And in 2018, the Department of Agriculture here in New Jersey set up a three county quarantine, um, uh, Warren, Hunter, and, and Mercer, in an attempt to, to try and, if not stop the spread of this insect, slow the spread. Uh, unfortunately, in 2019, they had to add additional counties of Somerset, Burlington, Camden, and Salem. Now today, um, it is pretty much all over the state. Um, this is a map. Uh, up until the beginning of this year, we had a reporting website. We have now turned that responsibility solely over to the Department of Agriculture. They had their own as well, and we were sharing data. And you can see that in 2018, the count, the, most of the reports we were getting were coming from Hunterdon and Warren County. Um, in 2019, this reports 
started to appear in other counties. And then last year in 2020, you can see that, that this insect was spreading fairly quickly um, throughout the state. And today um, it has been found or is known to have been established in all but Cape May County. And so this just gives you kind of a, a, a snapshot of when those reports come in. That tells us something uh, about what is going on. And again, you can see here, um, if you just look at the gray line, that is 2020. And you can just see that the accounts were indeed up dramatically. And they were up dramatically in the months of July, August, and September, which is the period when the fourth in stars, the red and with the black and white polka dot um, juveniles and the adults um, are on the scene. So as I said, um, New Jersey created their own um, quarantine in 2018. They expanded that in 2019. Uh, two weeks ago, they expanded that quarantine um, situation again and added an additional um, seven counties to the quarantine. And again, um, if you're going to report this insect, um, use that website there, badbug.nj.gov. That is the Department of Ag um, um, reporting site. Do not call your county office because they'll just tell you to call the, this website. This is where we want all the reports now to go. And so here's the quarantine area. The uh, red are the original counties. The counties that I have placed the stars in here are the new counties. So it's Middlesex, Monmouth, Union, Essex, and Morris County. And again, you can see uh, the other blue counties are where they have confirmed this insect is present. And again, Cape May is the only county where that's not the case. On a regional basis, um, this is the spread through the mid-Atlantic. So it is present um, in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, of course. It's also present in New York and it's up, it's in the um, middle Western New York, but it's also present in Westchester County and in the five boroughs of Manhattan, including uh, Central Park. And Central Park is very, very concerned about this insect. It's also uh, present in Delaware, in Maryland, in Virginia, a couple of counties in West Virginia. Uh, this year, it has also shown up in the eastern part of Ohio in two counties and in the southeastern part of Indiana in one county. And so this we feel is because of hitchhiking. People going into already quarantined areas, the insects or the egg masses are on vehicles and, and pieces of equipment or other things that are being moved to these other areas. And this insect has been able to establish this itself. And we unfortunately expect this to uh, continue to, to happen. Um, in terms of potential spread, um, there are people out there that do modeling, looking at environmental conditions, including things like rainfall and temperature and plant zones. And they have ways of trying to predict where this insect um, might occur and where it um, might be a big problem. Um, and so you can see here the red areas are the areas of, of high probability of establishing itself. Yellow is medium, green is low, and uh, white is unsuitable. And so, you know, it's got the potential to go through the, the Corn Belt in the Midwest, um, here in the East, of course. And also something that's troubling is out in the Central Valley of California where, and, and in the Los Angeles and the coastal areas where there's a lot of agriculture. Now, this doesn't mean that they will become a problem, uh, but this just says that the conditions are right for that to potentially happen. I'll also just mention that um, if you look at this map, it's um, very similar to another insect um, that was invasive starting in 2008, uh, the brown marmorated stink bug. 
And again, an insect from Asia and kind of can do well in the same areas as the spotted lanternfly. This is what, again, it looks like. This is in the palm of my hand. The adults are rather large. They're about an inch long. And if you compare that to the, the final uh, juvenile stage, they're quite a bit larger than that fourth instar stage. And I've, I've already pointed this out, but you can see the spotting both on the hind wings in the red and the spotting on the gray portions of the front wings. In terms of the life cycle, um, they are not laying eggs yet. This comes a little bit later um, in the fall, probably starting at the end of the month um, through October. I know this says August to November, but so far we haven't seen any egg masses. Um, unfortunately, they like to lay their eggs on all sorts of surfaces, uh, especially surfaces that are flat. They also like to lay their eggs on the undersides of horizontal surfaces, so branches and trees. Or if you're a vineyardist, um, on the horizontal wood posts that are used to keep the tension tight on the wires that support the vines. Those are favorite places for them to lay their eggs. Now the egg mass is the overwintering stage for this, and so that's how they survive the winter. In um, early spring, in April and May, they hatch um, and we begin to see the next generation um, for the year. The good news here is that this insect only has one generation uh, per year, uh, which is good. Um, if it had more than one, we'd have an even larger potential for, for um, developing high populations. The field rate hatch rates um, of the eggs is pretty good. It's 60 to 90 percent. Um, the hatch rate is impacted by cold weather. And so if you want to hope for something, hope for very cold winter. Um, they don't like temperatures much below 10 degrees Fahrenheit in terms of the survival of the eggs. As I've already kind of alluded to, it has four nymphal instars. And here you can see pictures of the um, early nymphs. Uh, this would, is either a second or a third instar. Um, they are completely black with white polka dots on them. And the, the, as I've already said, the red patches um, don't occur until the fourth instars. These insects in all stages, except of course the egg mass, um, are very mobile. Uh, the nymphs uh, can move up to three and a quarter feet per minute. And the nymphs can also climb upwards of 16 feet in 15 minutes. And they know this because researchers at, at, with the USDA in West Virginia, if you look at that picture on the lower right hand side, that's a juvenile that has a wire that's been glued with super glue to the back of the insect. Um, that's an antenna and with harmonic radar, they are actually able to track these individuals that they put this little antenna on. And they do several of them and they, they can um, calculate the numbers that I've given to you here. Uh, tree of heaven is very important to this insect. Um, it's felt that at some point during its life, it has to feed on tree of heaven, uh, especially the adult females. And so it plays a role. And right now, if you have tree of heaven and you're in an area where they're known to occur, it's very easy right now to find the adults on tree of heaven. And we, we have them all over campus and out at the Rutgers Gardens uh, on tree of heaven and other plants as well. Um, all of the instars are able to feed on tree of heaven. And so again, um, it is important. It's also important because it's another invasive from Asia. And so one of the reasons why they like tree of heaven is potentially because they evolved with it over in um, Asia. 
And as I said, the adults like it, they have to feed on it to mature. And again, I, I've already said that we have one generation per year, which is good. So this pictorial just kind of puts out the whole year's cycle for them. And so the eggs are present from September to June. The hatch starts in late April and May through June. Second instars show up in June and July, followed by the thirds at the end of June and into July. And then the adult, uh, I'm sorry, the, the fourth instars, um, July through September. Although this year, I have already at a point where I'm not seeing any of the fourth instars and I haven't for a couple of weeks. So we think that they're early this year because of the heat that we were having this year. And then again, the, the, it says July to December really in the fall, what's going to limit how long they hang around is temperature. And after a first few good frosts, um, they will all die and the problem will be done for the year. And then I've got a picture here of the juveniles that's probably second instars and they're feeding on the leaves of the, uh, the Atlantis or the tree of heaven. So this insect doesn't diapause. That's what entomologists call hibernation in, for insects. Um, but again, they do um, survive the winter through this. Um, the critical threshold for egg hatch is eight degrees C um, and 550 degree days. That's just a way that we calculate the impact of temperature on their development. They are cold blooded. And so the warmer it is, the faster they um, develop, but they also need to have a chilling period. And so that figures into this calculation as well. Uh, we are developing a degree day model, uh, which is a mathematical way of estimating when they will hatch and also when certain stages will appear based on temperature. Um, this is being done in, in my lab. One of my graduate students uh, is working on this uh, with the folks in Connecticut at the U.S. Forest Service Quarantine Lab. Up until two weeks ago, we couldn't work with this insect on campus because we don't have a special lab to contain them, but they do. And so my, my graduate student the last two summers has been sequestered in their lab uh, working on this, and, and he's developed the model and we are at the point now where we are collecting um, data on their presence when different stages are occurring in different parts of the state. And I don't know how many people, uh, all of you on the call, where you're located in the, in the state, but if you are in South Jersey and you have an area a park or something that that is um, infested with these in large numbers. Um, I'd be interested in finding out where that is um, so that we can sample it next next um, summer. And I'm also looking for places up in um, North Jersey. And if any of you are on the New Jersey side of the Philadelphia area. I am looking for places in that area that have large populations so that we can collect um, egg masses and do some testing with the egg masses as, as well. Now, in terms of the distribution of the egg masses, um, I've already kind of talked about this, but for small trees, most of the egg masses are going to be below three meters in height. Uh, larger trees, they will be all up and down um, the tree, up into the canopy. Um, there is a strong attraction um, of these to vineyards uh, in the wooded areas uh, because of the vineyards. Um, grapes are something that they feed on late in the, the, um, the season. And there has been shown, the folks in Penn State have shown a, a strong association with egg mass presence and wild grape vines. So that's another one of their hosts, wild grapes. And that's contributing to the problem. They have a very wide host range. 
not quite as bad or as big as the brown marmorate extinct bug, but it is uh, at least 70 different hosts. I've listed some of the families here and some of the common names of the things they feed on. And as you can see, things like sugar maple, red maple, birch, dogwood, black locust, American beech, uh, walnut, uh, mulberry. They do feed on pine, but not to any large extent. They will feed on some of our tree fruit crops, although no damage has been shown yet in those crops. Uh, poplar, willow, of course, tree of heaven, and then wild grapes, Virginia uh, creeper, and uh, wine grapes. And grapes, wine grapes is actually where damage has been documented in Pennsylvania um, based on feeding um, of this insect. And the other host that I will put, just mention that isn't on the list is uh, poison ivy. Um, they do feed on poison ivy in their early instars, and they will also feed on it as adults. And so this is just a, a listing of preferred hosts, um, tree of heaven, black walnut, grape, silver red maple, the river birch, willow. Um, those are preferred. And if I was looking for it right now, I would be looking at tree of heaven. I'd be looking at black walnut um, cultivated in wild grapes and red maple at this time for the adults. Um, they have several that they can complete development on, which basically means that they can feed exclusively on that and survive. Tree of Heaven, Black Walnut, and uh, China Berry are the top three in terms of completing development. So you probably all know what a uh, tree of heaven looks like, but I, I do have a picture here of a mature tree of heaven. I've also got um, pictures here of the inflorescence. So the, the newly um, blossomed flowers at the top on the right, and then later in the season when they're creating the seed pods. What most people don't realize is Tree of Heaven has female forms and they have male forms. So there's a female tree and there's a male tree. And if you're going to try and control this insect by managing your Tree of Heavens, um, the females are the trees that we, we suggest um, be targeted, if anything. Uh, and that's because if you don't, um, get all of the females, um, they will just add more seed to the seed bank and we'll, you'll continue to have um, saplings growing. And so this can be uh, confused with sumac. And the way you identify this is to, to look at the leaves. Um, they tend to have 10 to 40 leaflets um, and at the base of the the leaflet, you see one to two teeth. I have them circled here in the photograph. Um, the margins are very smooth. And if you crush them, people say it smells like peanut butter. I don't think so, <laughs> but that's just me. Um, but people do think it smells like um, peanut butter. And again, it contributes significantly to their proliferation. Okay. Um, Management. Um, in Pennsylvania, they have come up with some management options. I'm going to talk about them because we are actually suggesting that people do some of this. George? Yes. Before you get into, this may be a good time to just take a couple Perfect. of questions from, from their first uh, section, if, if that's okay. okay. I was thinking the same thing. Okay. Okay, great. So so there's a lot of questions coming in about reporting uh -huh. and where folks should be reporting, shouldn't be reporting. What if they've already reported? Should the, but they're in the same county? Should they Okay. So first first off, if you've already reported and you're thinking about reporting it again from the same municipality, same county, don't Okay. Um, also, the Department of Agriculture, if you are in a county that is in the quarantine, you don't need to report it. They know it's there. So reports 
from um, the other counties, uh, especially Cape May. I don't know if we have anybody here from Cape May. Um, if you remember from the, the map, um, they haven't gotten anything but hitchhiker reports in Cape May. They haven't gotten any reports of any establishment. Um, but again, yeah, if you're out of the quarantine, uh, I would continue to, to uh, report for at least now. Okay. There was, someone asked a question, is any idea why it's not in Cape May yet? Has it just not gotten there yet? Uh, it may be just the vegetation. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, it, it, and, and, you know, um, it's not, it's, at least what I know of Cape May, it's not wooded like it is in many other parts of the county. Okay. Um, we do have reports in counties that are part of the Pine Barrens, but uh, not as many as we do from some of the, the more heavily deciduous forested parts of the, of the uh, state. Okay. Um, and then you, you, I think you covered this, but if you could just review what the quarantine actually means. Um, oh, okay, sure. So the quarantine means that if you are going to leave the quarantine area and go to a place that is not in the quarantine area, um, legally you are required to inspect your vehicle for spotted lantern fly. And if you go to that website that I gave you, you can find forms that they want, especially the commercial people to fill out and keep in their trucks um, because there, there is some spot checking going on, not only in New Jersey, but in surrounding states. So commercial vehicles. Um, and it's not just the vehicle itself, it's, it might also need to check what's on the vehicle. So if it's a pickup truck and you're moving lawn furniture to some other location, especially where they're not already there, um, you're supposed to be checking those things. And then you look at, you sign, you have this thing that you're supposed to sign and keep in the vehicle. And there's a version for uh, homeowners. And then there's a version for commercial operations. Okay. All right, I think a lot of uh, other questions are related to control. Okay. So folks, we're going to pick up the question session at the end. All right. So I'm gonna start with non-chemical tactics because that's usually what people want to know about these days, or at least that's what I, the questions I get. And so there are a couple of things that you can do, starting with scraping off egg masses. Uh, you can do it very simply with a credit card or some other stiff card. Um, scrape them off the tree into a plastic bag. Um, we say, you know, put some hand sanitizer in the bag or some, some rubbing alcohol on the bag that will kill the eggs and then dispose of, of the bags. If you do that and you double bag them, you can put them in the garbage um, and you should be doing this from October through May. Now, how successful will this be? Um, the problem here is that it will help, but it's probably not going to solve the problem unless you can reach every place on the tree, okay? So if you have very hot, tall trees, uh, you may not even know there's egg masses in the top of the tree because you can't see them. Same thing with, with the uh, juveniles and the adults. When we sample, we actually look at the tops of trees with binoculars because we can't see them. They're, they're too small and they're too far up the tree. So it won't solve it, but it will help. Um, another thing that you can do is putting sticky bands around the, the trunk of the tree. Um, you see that here in the picture here with that yellow band. Um, this is something we used to do back when I was a kid uh, for gypsy moth in New England. Um, same premise. Um, they move around a lot. They get stuck in the sticky material. And once they're there, you know, especially with the adults. They can't reproduce and lay eggs if they're on the sticky bands. Now, we do, excuse me, just a second. We also 
suggest that if you are going to use sticky bands, and it doesn't have to be yellow, um, there are other colors out there. Color isn't all that important. But what is important is to put chicken wire around the uh, sticky bands. And that's to keep other things from getting stuck in that. And so this time of year, that could be a monarch butterfly, but it could also be a bird. Uh, it could be a lizard or some other, or an amphibian crawling up the tree. And so we're trying to avoid that. It's what we call bycatch, and it, it is a hazard with any kind of sticky trap. So if you're going to use the bands, please um, cover them with chicken wire. And the other thing that you need to do is, as you can see in this picture, there are a lot of adult spotted lanternflies on that sticky band. Um, there comes a point when there's so many on there, there's no surface area for them to get stuck to. And then the others can literally just walk over the top of their dead comrades and get to the rest of the tree. So you do need to replace them. Um, there is also another trap that is available. I'm going to show you a picture of it here in a second. It's called a circle trap. And there's been some success um, with trapping them um, and avoiding the problem of the bycatch um, that we have with the sticky um, tape. And so this is what it looks like. Um, you can buy these online. And so I've got pictures here of homemade ones that um, were come up that the Penn State folks have come up with. And so if you uh, want to jot down one of those websites, or actually all you really need to do is to remember Lanternfly Circle Trap, if you put that in Google, you'll come up with these websites and you'll come up with the commercial versions of them as well. And the idea here is as they move up the tree, the netting funnels them upwards and into a collection device. And so one of these is a Ziploc, a gallon Ziploc bag, and the other one is netting. And when it fills up, you can remove it and replace the, the Ziploc bag or the, or the netting and throw away the bag that's full of, full of the insects. Um, the Department of Ag um, does have a tree removal program. Um, they are recommending that, that, that if you want to, you should do this on your property if you have a lot of tree heaven and the lanternfly is present on the property. Uh, unfortunately, there, and I've been getting a lot of questions about this, there is no program uh, to help pay for the tree removal either by the counties at this point or by the, the Department of Agriculture. So uh, you, you would be on your own to have somebody come in and take the tree down unless you can, you're able to do it yourself. And so we target tree of heaven. The idea with this is that you wanna kill 90% of the tree, tree of heaven on your property. Uh, within that 90%, we would again want you to to remove all the female trees so you don't continue to have a problem. And then once you've done that, um, you also need to apply a, a stump treatment of herbicide to the um, tree of heaven stumps. And, and you, there are four that you can use uh, for the general public, probably glyphosate or Roundup it would be the easiest to obtain. Um, the other three are, are more for the, if you're hiring a commercial person, they can get access to those materials. And we really need to do that because if you're not familiar with Tree of Heaven, um, it ha does a lot of suckering. It sends out roots under the ground and all of a sudden you'll have saplings shooting up around the tree. And so things, um, these treatments, um, are designed to, to stop that from happening. Then with the remaining 10%, uh, when the adults are present, so this time of year, um, you would treat the um, trees with a 10% solution of dinotefuran. Um, this is a systemic material. It is a neonicotinoid material, so you, you need to know that. Uh, 
but this material, this this um, one of the of the group of neonicotinoids, uh, it actually doesn't last in the tree until spring, which is good. So some of the others, and, and if, if you notice here, I've said do not treat with imidacloprid. That's because it does stay in the tree and it is able to show up in the flowers in the spring and cause problems with um, pollinators. And so we don't want you to use imidacloprid. Again, dinotefuran doesn't have this problem. So it, it is safer to use from a pollinator standpoint. Now, if you don't have Tree of Heaven on your property, there's no reason for you to start spraying your trees now. You'll be wasting the insecticides and potentially harming other insects that may be on the trees that we don't want to kill. But if they do start to appear, you can spray. Um, you need to follow the label. And so you need to have either the specific species that you want to spray on the label for it to be legal, or if it has comments like you can spray this on woody trees or on ornamentals, that, that will allow you to uh, use the material. It does not have to specifically say spotted lanternfly as long as it covers the plant material that you want to treat. And of course, you need to follow the right rates and, and everything else. And so please read those labels before you do the application. We have some contact insecticides. So those are things that work by being directly in contact, either through the spray or the, the material as it dries on, it, say, a, a trunk. And they walk through it and pick it up on, on their tarsi, which is what we call their feet. By fenthrin. Um, is a pyrethroid insecticide. Carbaryl is a, is a carbamate. Uh, they are both effective. Um, and this work has been done by Penn State against both the juvenile stages and the adults. Again, uh, systemic insecticides that I just talked about, you can use that here as well. Again, only use the dinotefiran. You don't want to use the imidacloprid. Um, if you don't want to use the synthetic materials, there are some natural products. Uh, neem oil has some toxicity against these insects. And there is a, um, a uh, fungus that's commercially available. Uh, Bulvaria bassiana um, has some activity against these insects as well. Uh, just keep in mind, if you're going to use something like Bulvaria bassiana, um, it's a slow acting um, material so that they aren't going to die immediately like they would with the contact or the systemic materials. So what's at risk here? Um, well, in the landscape, uh, the honeydew produced um, causes a sooty mold. So again, especially with the adults, um, they are very large and they are all fluid feeders. So they're like a, a aphid on um, steroids. And if you're familiar with aphids and you know they excrete a lot of fluid that spots things, gets on people's cars, if they're parked under a tree where aphids are feeding or on lawn furniture, other types of things. The same thing happens with this insect. Um, however, um, the amount of it happening, because they are so large and because there's so many of them in some cases, um, the amount of, of um, honeydew being produced is, is a lot greater than it would be with aphids. And so you have the potential for a lot more sooty mold, which as you can see on the grapes in the top of the picture, um, that's that black area on the grapes. Um, and so that's an issue. Um, and so it can get on all sorts of things. Um, it, it's thought that the sooty mold, because of the large amounts that could be, can be present, um, could be damaging to the, the understory in terms of photosynthesis and um, causing problems that way. Now, if you walk through the woods and you're looking, um, if you look at the base of the trees right now where there's been a lot of adults feeding, um, 
you will see a black circle around the trunk of the tree on the foliage. That's the sooty mold that is coming from them excreting the honeydew. It's falling down, getting on that, that material and um, causing the, the mold to grow and turn them essentially black in color. Uh, the other thing, and I, I have experienced this out at the Rutgers Gardens, uh, when there's large numbers this time of year, you can actually hear the um, honeydew falling out of the trees. It sounds like it's raining um, when there's large populations. Uh, the forest, um, it's at risk because it is a reservoir for egg masses. And so they can be laying egg masses out in the, in the forest on trees that nobody is, is looking at and that's gonna contribute to the problem. Uh, in agriculture, I've already mentioned the wine grapes. Um, adult spotted lantern fly has been documented because of the feeding this time of year in such large numbers in the vineyard that have perfectly healthy vines uh, in this time of year in spring are dead because all the reserves that they had to get them through the winter have been basically uh, removed because of the feeding. Um, by the spotted lantern flies. There is a potential here for tree fruit. Um, they do feed as you saw in the list um, that I showed you. Uh, mainly this would be in peaches and potentially apples. But so far, um, there's been no incidence of damage to either of those crops, either here in New Jersey or over in Pennsylvania. Now, one thing that I forgot to mention is that these insects do not feed directly on the fruiting structures. They are only feeding as juveniles at first on undersides of leaves and then they move to the stem, leaf stem and the soft branches and then the other, the regular branches and the trunk of the tree. Um, so, you know, it's gonna have to damage the, the uh, tree fruit in, in terms of how much fluid they're, they're removing from those trees. Okay, so again, here's what um, an adult um, looks like. This one is not feeding, but if you notice the black areas, uh, this is on a branch and that's the city mold that has grown on, on this branch uh, because of the honeydew that's been excreted. Here's understory um, plants that you can see the same thing is going on. Here's a picture of the dead or vineyard in Pennsylvania. And this is in the springtime and you can see that all, the, all those vines are dead. And this is a picture of the, the um, honeydew on the leaves, um, probably in October. Okay. Um, Phenology, um, this is just in, in relation to vineyards. Um, they do, we do see them in the, vine, in the vineyards um, early in the season as first and second instars and then they leave. Um, they have been seen in the fourth instar stage in um, the vineyards, but this is not really the, the stage we're worried about. It's again, the adults. And so the, this is just a graphic as to when you can expect to see these at different times of the year on different um, plants. And so black walnut, you expect to see them in July and August, Alanthus, July and August, although they're still on Alanthus right now in September and um, in grape um, in June and July and then back in October. So how are we gonna slow it? Well, we need a way to be able to tell it's there when we can't see any of them because they're high in the tree. Uh, this has been worked on and uh, one of my colleagues in my department, Dr. Ann Nielsen and uh, Dr. Um, a couple of people over in Diener and Ecology and I can't think of Judy's last name. Uh, but they have developed an early detection system, basically that allows them to be able to detect its present presence without actually seeing the insects. Um, 
it's called um, environmental DNA. And if you watch the nature shows, it's very popular in um, aquatic systems to collect water and run this test um, to look for DNA for species that might be in that body of water that they don't know are there. And so it works for that. And it's been now developed um, for use with insects. The first insect it was developed for was for brown marmorated stink bug, where they could take the wash water in apples. They run all the apples through wash water. They take the wash water, they run it through filters and then do a DNA um, test and they could find it before the growers even knew it was in the orchard. So it's a very reliable tool. This is kind of the way it works. Um, Judy Lockwood, Lockwood, that's the lab. Um, so they collect water, um, they put it through a filter, a very fine filter, and then they use PCR um, to look for the DNA. And so what they would do is spray those trees or, or some of the plant material and somehow collect it and run it through their sampling. And so here's just a picture of it. Um, this is some of Judy's and Ann's um, students and postdocs. Um, they are just taking sterile water and it's a hand sprayer and they're looking for honeydew. And they spray that plant material, they collect that material, and then that's what they run through their filters. And that goes to the PCR test, what's left on the filter. And they also do it with a, a, essentially a paint roller that um, is wet to collect that as well. And so they have used this, as I've said, um, they used this in grapes in 2018 when it was first um, detected. And they actually found it um, in a um, small number of farms and two vineyards um, in 2018 where the growers did not know they were present. And so, here are all of the different management options and I, I'm running out of time here. So we'll just go again, physical scraping, the exclusion nets. Uh, remember that this is exotic. And so the USDA is looking for biocontrol agents to control this so we don't have to spray insecticides. They have two that they have found. These are wasps that attack the eggs. They are in quarantine. And as soon as they get them through quarantine and APHIS says we can release them, they will start to release them. Um, but we have to wait for that, the, them to go through quarantine. Um, there are other ones out there. So there are things that are feeding on it. I've got an assassin bug here. That's a wheel bug. Praying mantises and spiders. There's, I get a lot of reports and questions about this. The problem here is these are generalists predators, they feed on anything they can get a hold of in terms of insects. So they don't target anything specifically. And so they're not really good for management. And at that point, I think I'm out of time. So I'm going to turn it over, back over to you. Thanks, George. I want to let folks know that I did open up the poll. Um, so while George is answering some questions, you can answer our questions. Uh, okay, George, a lot of questions. Um, so a couple of people are asking if the spotted lanternfly also prefer oak trees uh, for laying their egg masses. Um, again, um, really the species of the tree doesn't ha really have an impact. Um, they will lay them on basically everything that has a flat, flat surface. And again, underneath the, the um, the horizontal branches, even 45 degree branch, you know, hanging branches. Um, I did some work looking for them um, up at Merrill Creek. And the first place I found an egg mass was on a tree that had been blown over at 45 degrees. And the whole underside of it was um, full of egg masses. So okay. it, it's where it is, it's not really the species. Okay, okay. Another question, do, can they lay, is there, is there more than one egg mass laid per insect? 
Uh, females will lay more than one egg mass, yes. Okay. Um, and I know I've put some few questions, few people have asked, how is the information being dis disseminated about spotted lanternfly? I know I'm seeing it all over the place. I've start, seen it on billboards, the Stomp mm -hmm. It Out campaign. Right. That's run by the Department of Agriculture. Okay. So we have information if you go to the Rutgers website or the Ag Experiment Station website, njaes.rutgers.edu, and type in spotted lantern fly. Uh, we have a, a uh, information there as well that will link. It'll link it to the Department of Ag to Pennsylvania. <coughs> okay. there's, there's a great deal of information there. Okay. And if someone does cut down a tree and it a tree of heaven, whatever it is, and there are egg masses, is there, what is the advice? What do, what do you do with that tree that you've removed? Oh, good question. I would say that if you're having it done commercially that their chipping process, if they're chipping to less than an inch in size is probably going to, um, cut up all of the egg masses that might be present. Okay, okay. And I also want to reiterate uh, what George said. There's a tremendous amount of information that uh, George has put out on the, the Rutgers website, along with Department of Ag, if you're looking for information to share with your, with your community. Um, okay, uh, does the spotted lunch fly feed on watermelon plants? <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to say no, because it has surprised us. I haven't seen any reports, but I, it does feed on basil. Okay. And it, you know, it, it's a matter of, we're still learning. It, it's a similar story with brown, that we have with brown marmorated stink bug. Uh, we didn't think because of the age, what it feeds on in Asia, that it fed on as much as it did here. And the more we kept, more we looked, the more we found it was feeding on other things. And I think that's going to continue to happen. Okay. Uh, is anyone working on a pheromone-based trap similar to what was developed to get rid of? Uh, that's another good question. Yes, the, um, a lab at Beltsville, Maryland with the USDA, um, they are looking for either an aggregation pheromone, which would be a pheromone that's released that attracts con specifics to that area and so there's interest in that because you know we, we get one adult on a tree and then all of a sudden there's hundreds of adults on the on the tree and so we think that they may have an aggregation pheromone if they can identify it then the potential for commercializing it and then a trap being pheromone based um, either aggregation or, or sex pheromone um, is a possibility. Uh, and so I know they are looking very hard. Okay. Um, I'm glad someone asked this question because I know I, I was asked this in my county. Um, have, have you heard of milkweed impacting spotted lantern fly? Anything, any reports of, of spotted lantern fly filling on feeding on milkweed and dying? Um, it will, from what I understand, feed on certain varieties of milkweed. There's, there are different varieties, uh, but I haven't heard anything about it actually killing okay. spotted lantern fly. Okay, and we've had a couple of people call the county office at, saying that they've seen this. Okay, well, it, it's possible. It's possible. Um, but the, the thought is that because this, they can feed on tree of heaven, which has lots of nasty chemicals in it to keep insects from feeding on it, mm -hmm. that their detoxification system may be able to handle the chemicals that are in milkweed. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it out of the realm of possibility. Okay. Okay. I, I've seen this also, George. It was very funny. I, I saw this in the field, spotted land from dead spotted lantern fly on milkweed. Um, quite a couple of people are asking to sort of review some of the information about uh, um, pesticide treatments. Oh, okay. 
So I mean, it, it depends. There, there are pesticides that are available that you can sp spray um, over and above what I was talking about in terms of whether you have tree of heaven on your property um, or not. Um, the ones I did mention, the, by, the bifenthrin, the carbaryl, which is seven, um, and the dinotefuran, um, those can be used on a lot of different plants, not just woody ornamentals. And they, they have pretty large labels. And, and again, if, if you're thinking about it because you see them on plant material and they may not be feeding, but you wanna kill them anyway, mm -hmm. uh, just be sure that what you select has the plant on the label. Um, and it's not just a legal thing. Um, there is also the potential, if it's not on the label, there may be a potential for phytotoxicity. In, in other words, the insecticide harming the plant. Okay. Okay. Um, and I will, a couple of folks are asking about the recording. This recording will be available online on the Earth Day Everyday website. And then we'll also send a follow-up email with some of the resources that George has, has mentioned, some of the fact sheets, information about spotted lanternfly. Feel free to, to sp spread the word. And if you like and remind me, I can send you a PDF of my slides. That okay, that would be great. No with it being posted. Okay, that, that would be great. Um, okay, so I think we've covered a lot, a lot of these questions. I guess the a last question for you, George, and, and you've sort of or or already kind of covered this, but but um Say someone has a very large infestation on their property of, of spotted lanternfly. How how would you say they should attack that that issue? What what would they should they be cut, assessing for for egg masses, putting out the traps? Um, um, it's, it's a particularly very all, bad problem. All of the above. All of the above. Okay. All of the above, with the exception, uh, we only talk about cutting down tree of heaven, not mm -hmm. other trees. Right, right. Yeah. Right. Or native trees. Yes, tree of heaven is an invasive. It is not a native tree to New right. Jersey. Right. And keep in mind, you have to consider the size of the tree as to whether you're going to try and do it yourself mm -hmm. or whether it, it's better to hire somebody commercially to spray the tree. Okay. All right. George, thank you so much. This You're has welcome. been really great, answered a lot of really good questions here. I want to uh, say thank you to all of you for participating this, this evening. Um, George has his contact information on the, the slide, the, the presentation, and if you wanna uh, put, that, put that back up. Um, and you can also contact him uh, directly. You can also contact your local county cooperative extension office. Um, if you have any questions about a uh, spotted lanternfly. I want to thank anyone who's listening to this as part of the of the recording. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and end the end the um, before you do I just put my email address in the chat. Yeah, I, I'm just going to Oh, it looks like someone maybe did already stop the uh, Oh, no, here we go. I'm just going to stop the recording. Okay.